this month, May 2023, uh, while is the 75th anniversary of the Nakba, the Palestinian catastrophe. And not only what happened in 1948, but the ongoing catastrophe that befalls Palestinians at the hands of uh, the Israeli occupiers, is re in, in, uh, an illegal Israeli occupation and a settler colonial apartheid regime. Um, but also America's complicity in this ongoing Nakba, this ongoing catastrophe for our Palestinian friends. We at Indiana Center for Middle East Peace uh, have had a number of different events. This past week, we visited with Sandra Tamari from St. Louis on Zoom, a Zoom interview. Sandra was the Palestinian representative in St. Louis who connected with, uh, who connected with the Black Lives Matter folks during the during the uh, uh, Michael Brown protests after he was killed in 2014. In two days on Saturday, uh, we'll be visiting on Zoom with Sam Bahor, our very good friend who's been here, but also who now lives in Ramullah. He's a Palestinian American businessman from Youngstown, Ohio. And uh, he'll be talking about the ongoing Nakba. We'll also be visiting with two uh, survivors from 1948. And so uh, that'll be on Zoom at 1 o'clock on Saturday. Next Thursday, then, we'll be visiting with Phil Weiss. Phil Weiss is a Jewish uh, non-Zionist who, uh, who was the creator and founder and uh, until recently retired editor of the online daily Mondo Weiss news source, which is must-reading for so many of us in the movement. You can find information in the, link, the Zoom links on our Indiana Center Facebook page. So here are the headlines as we think about Nakba and the ongoing catastrophe. Lauren Boebert and George Santos yesterday sent a resolution to Congress to make the AR-15 the national gun of the United States. While members of Congress travel to Israel, including Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries, to fawn all over Benjamin Netanyahu. While that was happening, today is the one year anniversary of the targeted murder by the Israeli military of Palestinian American journalist Shireen Abu Akleh. One year, already one year. Bombings in Gaza, at least 17 killed. That was the latest headline I saw, perhaps it's more now, including at least four children. Israel has increased the rate of house demolitions by 42% already this year compared to the same period last year. House demolitions. And defying Speaker Kevin McCarthy, who tried to cancel her event, an overflowing room joined Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib in commemorating the 75th anniversary of the Nakba uh, at a historic event on Capitol Hill. She would not be deterred. So after 75 years, uh, uh, what is the future? Philip Farah is a Palestinian Christian born and raised in East Jerusalem. Uh, he was arrested as a young man for his activism. He's a dangerous fella. He immigrated to the United States in 1978 at the age of 27. He's lived, studied, and worked in several countries in the Middle East and is now a natural resources economist uh, for the government in Washington, D.C. He's a founding member of the Washington Interfaith Alliance for the Middle East Peace, and he's a co-founder of the Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace, PCAP. And that's how I met Philip years ago, and we become dear friends in the last number of years. And really, it's a personal pleasure uh, for me to welcome you, Philip, uh, to Fort Wayne and to introduce you to our friends here. So thank you, Philip, for being here. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Michael. I'm told that uh, there isn't a pastor present here. Uh, and I'm told uh, to thank you. 
Thank you on behalf uh, of uh, the, thank you, and thank you for the board also of um, the Indiana Center and uh, for uh, Gary and Linda for hosting me and uh, Jean for um, hosting us yesterday. Um, and thank you all for coming. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. This is my second time uh, in Fort Wayne. Um, whoops, okay, so. Uh, I don't have a clicker, so I'm going to have to operate this manually. Um, this is a very different uh, presentation from any that I have done in the past. Um, and um, it's quite different. So you are my uh, test audience for this uh, TAC. Um, what it is is about you know, my personal history, my family's personal history and the history of my family, and how westernized, how strong the Western influence was in my family, in my upbringing, and why it is now that so many of my relatives uh, here in the US and back in the Middle East, in, um, there are very few left in Palestine, um, Things are so difficult that you know many people leave. Um, I have many relatives in Beirut and even more in Damascus and all over the Middle East in the Gulf area. Um, why it is that there is so much disillusionment with the U.S. Um, and why you know what happened? You know. Um, this is the story that I'm going to try to, to tell you, and why it is important. I mean, there's oppression all over the world. Uh, Israel is certainly not the only culprit in how it treats um, people. Uh, there are many, many causes uh, for good people all over the world to uh, fight and join, um, to champion the cause of the oppressed everywhere. And you know, uh, when we talk about boycott, divestment, and sanctions, we often are asked, well, why are you being selective? Why Israel? And this is you know, part of the story that I'm going to be trying to tell tonight. Why is it so important for us to be involved in this issue? By the way, um, do any of you recognize this, Michael? This is the village of Belain, actually. And you've probably met this woman. I think she's either the mother of uh, Iyad Burnat or one of the victims of, uh, um, of her family. Uh, there was a... a uh, she is using uh, the shells the spent shells of, um, uh, what do you call them, smoke? No, 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 the smoke, uh, tear gas, yes. Uh, when I visited Belain, the village from which this woman is, um, they showed us 65 at the time, different types of uh, tear gas canisters used against them, all made in the US. Uh, basically, Belain was a lab for the testing of American uh, crowd control uh, equipment, including the, and so she takes the spent, um, the, um, the, the, the shells, the empty shells, and uses them uh, to grow seedlings of beautiful flowers. I love this imagery. But it's also part of the story. So, I mentioned uh, my westernized background. Oh, okay, great, sure. That'll be great, yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, this is the outline of my talk. Uh, you know, my personal history, that of my family, and then 
Uh, I'm going to really, many of you have heard a lot of accounts about uh, Palestinian human rights. I want to go beyond that, about specifically why it is so important for us as Americans to uh, pay attention to this issue and to be on the side of peace and justice. Um, is, uh, yeah, uh, so one aspect of this is Israel's very destabilizing influence in the Middle East. Um, related to Israel in many, many ways, it's the biggest champion of Israel, the biggest ally. Ally, Israel is the junior partner in so many ways to uh, the US, all over the world, actually. Uh, the, the Israel has acted not only in the Middle East, it has acted in Africa, it has acted in Central America, etc. And I'll be talking about that. And then um, uh, encouraging militarism in the United States and the corrupting influence in the, in the democratic process, in elections, for example. And um, so I will close with what is our role vis-a-vis -vis all these things. Next, please. So this is my family. Uh, this photo uh, was taken probably 1958. I'm the person with a sad look over, the, over there to the right. I don't know what happened. Uh, one of my siblings must have stolen one of my candies or something. And uh, my elder brother, my parents, and my younger brother, George, my mom who passed away last year at the age of 103. Uh, and my father to the right, uh, my father uh, had a religious vow uh, to walk from Jerusalem to Bethlehem uh, at uh, the New Year's, uh, the, at New Year's uh, Eve, uh, according to the Orthodox calendar, which happens to be, oh no, actually Christmas Eve, according to the uh, Greek Orthodox calendar, which is around the first of the following year. And this is on uh, one of our walks. A friend of mine took, took it. And um, uh, many of my friends used to come and accompany us on that walk. Now, of course, uh, F, uh, you know, for the longest time, he could not make that walk because we were on the east side of the border and uh, with Israel, and uh, we couldn't walk directly from Jerusalem to, um, uh, to Bethlehem. We had to stop in a village and uh, walk the rest of the way to Bethlehem. Uh, and then after uh, the wall came up, of course, you couldn't do that anyway. Uh, you'd have to go through the checkpoint, uh, which is not a pleasant experience at all. Next, please. Oh, uh, so, you know, you can see the Western influence in the family. And, uh, you know, my father, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, this is the home of my uh, maternal uh, grandparents. My mom is right here. Uh, it was a very large family. Um, and Behind them is their beautiful house, and that is uh, taken in 1939. Uh, my grandfather was a somewhat of a mathematical uh, whiz kid. He taught at three different schools. He was so good in mathematics that he was sought after by different schools, all Christian missionary schools, um, Western schools again. And uh, yes, and this is a picture of the same house uh, in, in 2019, I took that, the first time I had seen it. Uh, this was their house in Western Jerusalem, and uh, they were ethnically cleansed, of course, in 1948, along with the 800,000 Palestinians, the vast majority of the Palestinian population. You probably heard that story from others, other speakers. And this house is now uh, the house, of course, of uh, uh, Jewish, uh, uh, you know, uh, residents. Actually, several families. Um, 
and there's a big story to that house, but I don't want to take too much time, uh, about the neighborhood. The neighborhood was a kind of middle class to upper middle class neighborhood. And after 67, because it was right on the, after 48, because it was right on the border, uh, the Israeli authorities used it to house uh, immigrants from North Africa. And um, many of them were from middle class uh, families in North Africa. But Israel is a racist community, uh, is a racist country, not only towards Palestinians, but also to Jews of darker skin. And um, so they put them in the most dangerous spot in Jerusalem, you know. And it turned from a, uh, what used to be a, a very prosperous uh, middle class uh, neighborhood, Palestinian neighborhood, to become a ghetto for poor North African Jews who had hardly any services. In fact, they didn't have electricity because the electricity. Anyway, uh, and, but now it's gentrifying. And the North African, because it's central, uh, has a central location very sought after. Uh, and you've seen gentrification in this country. Now the North Africans are all moving out because uh, the rents are very high and you know, uh, more affluent, mostly uh, European uh, Jews are taking over the neighborhood. I didn't want to go into too much detail, but I couldn't help it. <laughs> and um, next, please. So the, this is an excerpt of uh, diaries that my father kept for 50 years, starting in 1933, daily entrance through 1988. His Arabic was excellent. He wrote uh, poetry in Arabic, uh, but uh, he uh, wrote his diaries in English for some reason. Um, and um, this particular page shows how he had J Jewish friends, uh, you know, in the 1930s. This is from... 1936, and he actually, from reading his diaries that period, now I have the whole collection, 50 years worth, um, European Jews who, who were fleeing the Nazis, and um, he really was extremely sympathetic to the Jews. Sometimes I would say, oh my God, you're, I mean, you're more sympathetic to the Jews than to your people, but then you see over the 50 years, well, the first 20 years of the diaries, how slowly he was beginning to see what was happening. And slowly you hear more, uh, you, you read more entries about Jewish terror. Um, so, uh, and like I said, you know, so I, I was brought up at a, an English school, um, you know, and my sister, uh, went to a German nun school, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, very very strong in, uh, Western influence. You know, we were listening as much to the Beatles and the, um, you know, Clearance Clearwater revival uh, more than you know Arabic songs. We had friends who were in teeny bop bands, you know, that played in discotheques and. Uh, very strong American culture, uh, American influences. Uh, what 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 changed all of that? You know. Please next. Ah yes, and so in 1976, uh, I was at, at the time uh, freshly graduated from the American University of Beirut. That was another, you know, Western, strong Western connection. Uh, an excellent university, produced great uh, uh, leaders in the Arab world. And um, I was beginning to become very politically active. Oh, I wanted to mention uh, uh, something else. Like the magazines we used to read at home were Newsweek and Time and so on. So in addition to following uh, Clearance, <laughs> Clearwater Revival and uh, Elvis Presley and, you know, uh, I also read the news from America. And I remember just a few days ago uh, was the anniversary of the bombing of the... Um, Baptist Church in Birmingham. 
uh, right? It was uh, the 60th, or I don't remember exact, the anniversary. I think it was the 60th, uh, 60th anniversary. And it reminded me of how I read that in Newsweek magazine, I think, or Time magazine, I'm not sure. And, you know, so in addition to the, um, to the kind of Western pop culture, we were also exposed to the problems of racism in America, and you know, I was beginning to get more and more politicized. Um, and um, I was quite active in the student movement in Beirut, 1968. You know, there were student revolutions all over the world, and um, I was very much part of that. I came back. I was working with. Uh, we were meeting with uh, Israelis who were against the occupation after 1967, uh, and I, uh, th there was a group of us who started working with Israelis opposed to the occupation, reaching out, you know, to Jews who, who uh, saw that the, wrong, the wrongs that were being committed to us. And for that reason, I was arrested and spent two months in an Israeli prison under what's called uh, administrative detention. Administrative detention was uh, inherited from the British mandate who ruled Palestine before 48. And you, uh, you, you're not given a trial. You don't even know what the charges against you are. And administrative detention was used not only against Palestinians, uh, but also against Jewish militants who were, you know, terrorists, actually, uh, against uh, the British. But the Brits, uh, but as soon as the Brits left, the Israeli, uh, now you have the Isra Israel, uh, and they adopted uh, many of the oppressive uh, laws of uh, the, the British, British mandate, including the administrative detention. So I, I was never... I never knew what the charge against me was, and for two months I was in prison. Now, uh, uh, in 1977, I started applying for a visa to the U.S. to study, to come to this country to study, and there was a consular agent by the name of Alexander Johnson who um, interviewed uh, Palestinians who wanted uh, visas to... Um, uh, to come to the United States, and she noticed that there were many Palestinians like myself who were arrested with no charges and tortured. And so she sent a series of, um, uh, of cables called um, State Department 1500, I think, Jerusalem 1500 cables, detailing the stories of torture that she heard from applicants like myself. Uh, and this was uh, published in the New York Times. Actually, uh, I'm in this story under the name of Ferris, I think. <laughs> I use this pseudonym. Next, please. Okay, so, um, you know, um, likewise, yesterday uh, in a gathering, uh, I was asked about, uh, well, I talked about uh, how in the Arab world after the colonial era, after independence of the Arab countries, uh, there was really a great deal of love for America because America was seen as being different from the old colonial powers, from France and England, you know. Uh, the Wilson Doctrine, you know, advocated for self-determination of people everywhere and that kind of thing. And Jamal Abdel Nasser became a very big leader in the Arab world, a nationalist leader, I'd, I'd say more appropriately, a patriotic leader uh, trying to dismantle the vestiges of the old colonial regime by nationalizing the Suez Canal and the like, right? Uh, and he had very good relations with them. In fact, the CIA wrote reports out about how this is a good guy, we can really work with him. But they started imposing very, very draconian um, terms for, um, for relations with the Egyptians. And, as, uh, and, and slowly, uh, Jamal Abdel Nasser, uh, uh, ruler of Egypt, uh, started getting disillusioned. And, but that was happening all over the third world. 
and along with uh, leaders from India, um, um, uh, Nehru, Nekruma from Ghana, Nasser uh, from Egypt, Sukarno in Indonesia, Tito in Yugoslavia, they formed the non-aligned, uh, 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 the non-alignment pact. And um, so uh, the, the Americans saw this as a big threat because Arab nationalism was growing and threatening their interests, their oil interests in, the, in Saudi Arabia and the Gulf countries. And they did everything they could to uh, discredit Egypt and um, result in regime uh, change. And Israel played a very big role. Uh, in 1956, there was a tripartite aggression and the occupation of uh, the Sinai. Um, anyway, so Israel really started playing this role of being a kind of junior partner for the West, especially for the United States. Now, 1967 was the culmination of, um, you know, the, the, really the victory against Nasserism, against this non-aligned uh, force that wanted independence, not only from Russia, from Russian influence, but from, you know, the, the idea was, a truly third world independent movement. Uh, and um, Israel's defeat of uh, Nasser in 1967 was an incredibly important turning point. And it was the defeat of secular ideology in, in the Arab world, you know, and um, of a really kind of far more modernistic view path of you know, really looking for um, economic development independent of the big powers, right? Um, and this was replaced, you know, as in other parts of the world, was replaced by Islamism, uh, which the U.S. really welcomed greatly. Uh, the Saudis stepped in after the defeat of Nasser uh, and the defeat of the secular ideology. And, you know, the Saudis' version of Islam is an extremely reactionary version of Islam, um, you know, and later spawned movements like uh, Al-Qaeda and ISIS. And, you know, it really was, in a, in a way, bl uh, blowback, you know. You defeated the secularists, the people who were really modern, who wanted to uh, you know, create a prosperous, independent society uh, because you wanted an alliance with oppressive people who were protecting your interests in the Middle East. And uh, Islamism, in, extremist, in its most extremist form, st replaced secular uh, emancipatory uh, ideologies. Next. Oh, and, you know, um, so... The same has happened, Israel played a similar role uh, of being kind of the junior partner, not only in defeating Nasser, but you know, in the uh, Iraq war, there were actually Israeli advisors uh, that uh, were, for example, you, uh, advising the US forces on how to use caterpillars um, to punch through buildings to avoid, um, to avoid, uh, you know, being in the open, exposed to the um, resistance, the armed resistance of the Iraqis, thereby killing many, many innocent civilians who were basically killed in their homes with these giant, ugly caterpillars. That was, you know, a specialty that Israel had developed, used against the Palestinians and adopted uh, by American forces. You know, Israel has also played a role in destabilizing Syria, etc. But even beyond the Arab countries, you know, Iran, uh, uh, under the Mossadegh, uh, Mossadegh was elected uh, uh, democratically in Iran and was overthrown by 
the CIA with great assistance from Israel. And the Iranians knew that. And you know, the, um, the alienation of the Iranian people from uh, Israel is very much, you know, there's a history to that. It didn't come out of the blue. Um, Israel played an extremely important role in some African countries, uh, supporting dictators. Uh, the, the overthrow of uh, Lumumba in, um, in the Congo. Uh, it played a role in Central America, like Dobuisson, who was the head of the death squads in El Salvador, in El Salvador, was, uh, in El Salvador, was trained in Israel. Israel has played this role of you know, dirty ops, really, all over the world, not just in the Middle East. Uh, I, uh, I'm showing this picture of uh, uh, Menachem Begin, who was prime minister for a long time in Israel. And actually, that's Rabin, you know. So Menachem Begin, the extreme right, but also the Labour Party, meet uh, Rabin and meeting with Vorster. And Vorster, the head of the apartheid regime in South Africa, was actually a Nazi sympathizer during the World War II. His party was a you know, a, uh, uh, basically a fascist right-wing party that supported uh, uh, the Nazis. And today you see this again uh, with Israel um, very sympathetic, ha having strong, strong relations with fascists like Orban in Hungary, you know, uh, who's an, an anti-Semitic fascist, but, you know, this, uh, you know, strong relationship with the extreme right. Yes. All of this is to show that, you know, the relationship of Israel as a junior partner, partner of the U.S. has, you know, resulted in alienating more and more people, not all, against the U.S. Strength, because they, they're viewed as a strong ally of Israel, and they're doing these ugly things, not only in the Middle East, but also in other places in the world. Uh, this is uh, a quotation from one of the writings of Noam Chomsky, and um, he, uh, I'm, I'm gonna read it. Uh, from, um, he's quoting a, an important leader in the uh, Anti-Defamation League, one of the most pro-Israeli uh, organizations in this country, and he's saying, um, the new, the real anti-Semitism turns out, not according to the ADL, turns out to be not the boring old stuff about kill the Jews uh, and denying the Holocaust, but rather that, that you know, it is giving war a bad name, meaning people, peace groups you know, that are opposed to war, giving war a bad name and peace a, too favorable by <laughs> press, protesting against the Vietnam War and U.S. crimes in Central America, uh, America sniping at the defense budget, and in general, uh, interfering with U.S. power. You know, all of these things are supposed to be the new anti-Semitism. And, you know, the you know, supporters of Israel today, you know, the extreme Christian right, extremely pro-militarist, you know, and this is a, another thing that is alienating. Young people, fortunately, are not buying this anymore. Buying, you know, that Israel is a democracy and a beacon of enlightenment. They see that it is aligned with the most militarist and most chauvinistic forces in this country. This is uh, another quotation from a group called PNAC, the Project for the New American Century, which is an ultra um, um, right wing uh, group um, that, um, uh, you know, uh, neocons, right? And many of them are, you know, ultra uh, champions of Israel in this country. Um, now, there is actually, during the Iraq War, in the early part of the Iraq War, there was a document 
uh, about creating the new Middle East, talking about uh, dividing the Middle East countries in along sectarian lines, you know, to break Iraq into Sunni, Shiite, and Kurdish uh, uh, mini states, break uh, Lebanon into <laughs> uh, Christian and Maronite, uh, break Syria into Alawite and the North. Yeah, and, and, and actually Netanyahu was one of the signatories of this document. It, it became public, you know. Um, but here's another quotation. Let me take this off. Well, you can read it. Advanced forms of, this is a, pub, a quotation from one of the, uh, um, the, their publications called Israel Trains U.S. Oh, uh, no. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. It's called Rebuilding American Defenses by PNAC, the, pop, the uh, project for the new American century. It says, advanced form of biological warfare that can target specific genotypes may transform biological warfare from the realm of terror to a politically useful tool. It's just unbelievable how militarists, you know, the, the biggest champions of, uh, of uh, Israel in this country are. Next, please. This is very recent uh, from a book by um, James Bamford, uh, and it is, uh, you know, based on um, uh, some uh, un, uh, unclassified documents. Um, Israeli Prime, Prime Minister Netanyahu dispatched a secret Israeli agent to the United States in the spring of 2016 to help Donald Trump with President presidential election. The agent met with advisors of Trump and offered to share secret intelligence with the campaign against Hillary Clinton. Uh, so um, this was on Democracy Now!, by the way. The book, my brother read it recently. I haven't read it, but it's really tremendous uh, about how Israel has interfered with the elections. And by the way, I'm not taking a partisan position. It's not only the Republicans that uh, have championed Israel. It is also very, I mean, Hakeem Jeffries um, is today in Israel or? Yeah. And he, he is also a very, very big supporter of Israel. You know, Biden um, uh, at one point said, I am a Zionist, you know. Uh, and uh, so it's really not only the Republicans, it is really the elite of both parties. Next. And actually, by the way, the report about uh, the Russian interference in uh, the um, elections found uh, actually that, you know, the, there was much more interference by Israel than there was by the Russians. Um, and recently, uh, APAC has started concentrating um, on defeating progressive candidates, um, especially in the Democratic Party. And this is the case of uh, um, Andy Levin uh, of Michigan. And uh, he's a former congressman. And uh, he lost the primary very largely to funding from pro uh, from APAC, uh, from pro-Israeli groups uh, that uh, put their money uh, with his opponent. Now, this is, he's obviously Jewish, and he, uh, you know, called himself a Zionist, but he was critical of the more, you know, excessive uh, abuses that the Israeli government practices against Palestine, so it's not uh, against the Palestinians, so it's not good enough to be a Zionist, you have to be a real extremist, right-wing, you know, Zionist who, who, who uh, you know, signs off on anything that the Israeli government does. And he was defeated. And there are many other cases. They tried to defeat uh, um, uh, Ilhan Omar uh, 
They tried to defeat uh, Rashid Atlaib. They did not uh, succeed, but they did succeed in many, many cases. Uh, Peter Beinart, by the way, who's a wonderful uh, a Jewish um, writer who himself also calls himself a Zionist, or at least used to, uh, has written a great deal about this issue, about how APEC has put a lot of money in defeating progressive candidates in Congress. Next, please. Well, uh, Michael mentioned uh, Sandra, who spoke uh, recently. Uh, she was in Ferguson, and uh, um, you know, she um, there was a big presence of uh, Palestinian activists in the protests after Ferguson, um, and the same after um, Standing Rock. There were many Palestinians there also protesting alongside uh, native peoples. And um, there is now a growing um, movement among Palestinian solidarity groups to connect uh, the dots with all progressive movements in the US. You know, uh, Israel built the wall uh, and companies that uh, in Palestine um, as part of his apartheid control of the Palestinians, and company, Israeli companies have helped build the wall, get lucrative contracts for building the wall on the Mexico border, Elbit, for, Elbit Systems, for example. And uh, the connection also with the uh, police departments. You ought to try to find out whether, <laughs> whether way, uh, Fort Wayne uh, police department has received any training from Israel. I mean, Israel now sells its weaponry uh, and its skills in crowd control, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's a big selling point because they are tried against this uh, population, this captive population. As uh, I showed you earlier by showing the picture of Balain, how there are so many weapon systems that have been used in Gaza, and Israel parades these weapon systems in uh, military shows all over the world, tried and tested weaponry. Uh, that's it, I think, the next one. So yes, uh, you know, um, what is it that we should be doing here, you know? Uh, what, what you are doing, um, supporting uh, the Palestinian cause, uh, the cause for true peace and justice. And um, there have been big successes, uh, especially the churches, you know, in this country. Um, main, mainstream Protestant churches have passed resolutions calling Israel an apartheid state, um, resolutions divesting from companies that, protect, that uh, um, profit from the occupation, uh, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, the Episcopalians, the United Church of Christ, in fact, is the most uh, uh, courageous, I think, in exposing uh, Israeli apartheid. Um, so, you know, the really important part in this is to tell the Israelis that what they do is wrong, and the psychological impact is extremely important because there's a lot of racism uh, built into this conflict. You know, the, the Israel sees itself as part of a superior Western world, uh, you know. Um, and uh, if, if we in this country um, are telling the Israelis, look, we do not support what you're doing. We don't condone it. It has a tremendous psychological impact. Um, one of the things that my group, the Palestinian Christian Alliance for Peace, is trying to do now is to raise conscience, um, consciousness, uh, conscience. Well, no, raise, uh, educate people about the role of Christian Zionists who raise a great deal of money for the most extreme groups in Israel and in supporting uh, um, settlements, settlement construction. And these are so-called charities that are tax deductible. 
and uh, they are funneling literally millions of dollars uh, that are escaping uh, tax uh, treatment to support the most extreme parties in, in Israel. And the rise of the Israeli extreme right is very, very much connected to the support that they are getting from Christian Zionists and the power, the power that they wield in the US. Um, they are losing a lot of support from young Jewish people who see that Israel, you know, the supporters of Israel are at the same time the biggest supporters of militarism, the greatest uh, uh, supporting the most intolerance against LGBTQ communities, um, against uh, immigrants' rights, etc., etc. They're connecting the dots and being dissatisfied with, they're not buying it anymore. Uh, so, is, so Israel is counting a lot more on Christian Zionists. Th this is for them the biggest ally now in this country. I think I probably talked too much, Michael, right? So, 